So, uh, do you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So we are live. Um, we're going to wait just a couple minutes, like we talked about, so that Facebook can notify everyone that we're here, and then we'll get started. So. Okay, just a All right. All right. Hi, everyone. We are just waiting as more people tune in, and we might have another ambassador joining us here in a minute. Um, so we are going to start our Facebook Live in about another 30 seconds to a minute. We'll get started talking. So thanks for joining us today, and we'll talk in just a couple minutes. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Samantha with the NVLD Project. It's good to see you all again for our monthly Facebook live chat. Today, I have Sam with me, who also works with me at the NVLD Project. She is our part-time <laughs> development and marketing and social media um, person, She's still in school. Uh, junior year? Senior, Senior year. Senior year of college. Um, so she's going to be joining us today. She's learning more about this process and all of this kind of stuff. So no sound. Someone says we have no sound. Can we confirm uh -oh. that? Maybe try, if you can't hear us, but you can read our closed captioning. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner of your Facebook Live video, you might look at the volume thing that's on there and see if that's muted or not. Sometimes that can start muted. Yeah, so maybe try doing that. It's working now. Okay. I'm just gonna get it pulled up on my phone so I can see comments as they come in. Our executive director can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry, guys. A little unprepared today. Okay. Awesome. All right, so we're going to get started today. We are back this week with a couple more of our ambassadors um, wanting to talk about social situations and social scenes and relationships as well as dating today. Um, and so I know that you guys love it when we hit on some of these topics and we thought that our ambassadors would be the perfect people to have this discussion with. Um, in case you have not met them before or seen them on our website, we've got Benjamin, Megan, Aaron, and Kristen with us today, and we're going to give each of them um, a little bit of time to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their background and experience and um, just so you can meet them before we get started. So we'll start with you, Benjamin. So thanks for having me on. I'm a, I'm a bilingual social worker in New York, and uh, I work a lot with the people with NVLD, and I also have it, had my own struggles with NVLD myself. So um, I try to kind of provide both uh, psychotherapy and practical strategies for people uh, in New York City, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania you now as well, mostly online and sometimes in person. Yes. And if you've ever checked out our blog section before, Benjamin actually writes about this topic 
quite often for us. There's some good blogs on the website, so check those out afterwards if you have time. So welcome, Benjamin. It's good to see you again. Um, I think you were on our first ambassador chat that we had on Facebook. Right. And so was Megan. Um, so mm -hmm. welcome back, Megan. Go ahead. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm Megan. I'm from Canada. Um, I own my own business called Beautiful Minds. So I work with youth with learning disabilities. Um, we've been virtual because of, because of COVID, so had to go from in-person to virtual, so that's been a bit of a transition, but it's been good, and yeah, it's a little bit about me. There you go. Welcome back, and then we have Erin with us, who is a new ambassador. We have not had her on Facebook Live before, so Erin, if you'll introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erin, um, and I'm a hall director at a college in Pennsylvania, and it's great to be here with you all. And then Kristen, who has been an ambassador for a while, but has not been on one of our Facebook Lives yet. So welcome to your first one. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dr. Kristen Vogt here. Um, I have a PhD in education, and I'm currently the director of the STEAM and uh, exploring department for the Boy Scouts of America here in Chicago, which is where I reside. And I'm also a writer. I write for, I'm a science writer for Massive Science, uh, Science Daily and uh, National Geographic. Very cool. Awesome, thanks guys. We are very excited to have you all on. Um, we may have another person hopping on in the middle of our chat. So if we do, we'll stop and let him introduce himself and get to know him. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started today. So thank you all for joining us. If you missed the very beginning, we're gonna be talking about social scenes and relationships um, and also a little bit of dating, getting into some of that today. So we're gonna start off with just something very simple that I feel like, especially in today's pandemic life, even though things are opening back up, um, is a great question. And I feel like we actually get this a lot from parents and then younger adults who are just trying to figure out how to navigate life. But where do you guys meet people? Where do you meet new friends? How are you finding, um, I get, well, we'll get into dating later, but like, where do you find friends? Where are you able to meet people as adults post school mm -hmm. life? open to anyone. <laughs> I guess I can start. Uh, one of my biggest challenges is that I'm often too busy. Uh, I take on a lot of volunteering roles. I mean, it's as an academic, you are expected to do that. The nice thing though, is that a lot of times these people end up becoming your friends. So a lot of people I've met as a board member for the Oriental Institute, which is a museum affiliated with the University of Chicago. Met some good friends that way. Met a lot of friends through work. Um, I have a great workplace, so it's been great to make friends that way. And then <clears throat> also a lot of times internet groups that also have meetups. So I'm a member of a cooking club, which I never thought as a young person I was going to do cooking, but I was like, I just want to hang out with other people who are in their you know mid to late 30s, early 40s, who've got kids and just need a weekend off. So identifying hobbies and then also connecting it to either your education or your profession can sometimes lead to friendships. Are those like Facebook groups that internet groups you find? Um, so the work one's obviously not, but uh, the other one was, it's almost like fight club where it's like, we don't talk about <laughs> cooking club, <laughs> uh, but that was, it started off as a Facebook group, uh, which was working mothers of the area I live in. And then a couple of them were like, Hey, we were trying to do a cooking club, uh, join our listserv. And so the listserv, I've noticed lists, listservs tend to be a lot more, a lot less dramatic than Facebook groups. <laughs> um, probably because it's linked to, you know, direct contact immediately. So it was a Facebook group that led to a listserv. Okay, very cool. So work and then volunteer. So finding hobbies and like kind of meeting people with similar interests that way. And then in the workplace. Yeah. And even if it's not someone who you're going to be like, oh my God, you're my best friend forever. Um, but people that you will repeatedly see, say hi to, and just have quick checkups with. So uh, volunteering with the forest preserves here in Chicago is a big thing I recommend for almost everybody, um, simply because you're all there for a very core reason. So 
a lot of times that's where a lot of people meet friends. Um, so volunteering to either build trails, lead events, um, even something as simple as uh, going out and helping spread seed or help make seed bombs for our monarch butterflies. Finding something when people have a common core and a common purpose and a common ideal, you'll find already that you've got, you know, that core meetup in there. Also, people tend to hang up their bad attitudes for the most part, which, you know, having NVLD a lot of times I'm like, are they mad? Are they not mad? But if people are going to volunteer. They're, they're already like in a better mood because they know that they want to do something good. So you've already got that. You've got that veneer of sorts going into that. That's awesome. Anybody else anywhere else outside of work? No. Well, I mean, I mean, for me, I do a lot of, um, the key is consistency. Um, so I try to find groups that like, or I want to go a lot of fairly often. So I do hiking clubs because I know I like to do that. Um, and I kind of try to balance it between hiking clubs and, uh, you know, weekend activities. And also I find groups that are like more supportive where we chat and we talk, you know, et cetera, whereas there's more of a supportive kind of element to it. And that really works for me because I get that balance between actually doing something and having a more kind of supportive community uh, kind of environment as well. So I do both and I usually, usually use meetup.com to okay. meet these groups. Yeah. That's what I was gonna ask, where do you find those like more supportive like talking groups and stuff like that? So you're saying meetup.com, which I've, is also an app. Yeah, I've done that. I've done uh, other kinds of, um, you know, different kinds of like, you know, there's different kind of like example, uh, you know, supportive for young adults in, you know, in transition uh, in New York or something like that or Jewish young adults or, you know, young adults with um, with learning differences. Uh, there's a, a, group, a group of mission in uh, but, you know, people with different invisible disabilities, anything like that. Uh, you can kind of find that and 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 join up and, and that's more supportive sometimes in those elements. So I kind of like to balance that, you know, having that kind of supportive, but as a commonality and we're discussing versus uh, activities as well. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely, we've heard of Meetup and I don't know if you've used Meetup in the comments, just like drop a note um, telling us if you've used it and had success with it. Maybe you guys um, can even share different groups in Meetup um, that you have. Maybe you could like link them in the comments or even if there's a Facebook group that any of the people watching recommend. I definitely think this would be like a great video hub to kind of share some of those groups in the comments for others to connect with and, and check out as well. So drop those below if you know of any. Um, Megan and Aaron, do you guys have anything else to add to this one about like what's a good place to meet people or how do you go about meeting people as adults? Right. Um, I think there's a lot of really good like NVLD Facebook groups that I've belonged to. Like there's so many out there. <laughs> it's hard to keep track, but I feel like that's a really supportive kind of group and community for me. That's how I've met a lot of different folks with NVLD. Awesome. Yeah. And I got, I've been involved with the National Center for Learning Disabilities. So like getting to know other people with other learning disabilities and having that sense of community. Um, Pre-COVID, we all went to Washington, DC. So that was a great experience um, to network and meet those people in person. And now it's been virtual for the last two years. Yeah. So common theme to everyone's answer is, I think finding something you're interested in, whether it's a hobby or um, some sort of like advocacy or something that you're interested in so that you already have that core, uh, like common core and common interests. And then finding those groups, whether it's online, on Facebook or Meetup, um, or even just if you're working in a certain industry, you obviously already have a shared interest because you're working that industry. So like, meeting people at work and then expanding outside of that. So I think that's really good. Awesome. Um, let's see, our next question is, we've heard from a lot of people who come up with signals with their friends and family to help them read social situations. So when they're in certain social situations, they'll like have somebody they rely on to help them understand things that maybe they're not um, getting right away. Do you guys have anything like that set up with your friends or family where they're alongside you in social situations in case you are having trouble um, reading body language or understanding kind of like uh, like someone's uh, attitude or, or emotions or something? No one? 
No worries. We get questions. We get so a lot of these questions we're pulling from emails and past Facebook lives. So if you guys don't have answers or don't relate, totally fine. Um, who all has attended Zoom like social events in the past year? Has anyone? I have. <laughs> everyone. <is> everyone, <laughs> everyone has heard of Zoom at this point. <laughs> awesome. Um, so we're kind of curious, like what is the most interesting Zoom event that you've attended and have you enjoyed Zoom events? Are you tired of them? Do they give you fatigue? What's been your experience with like the Zoom social life over the last year? Uh, it's been both great and bad on my experience. So the good was um, I did a young nonprofit leadership uh, workshop series with Loyola University. Uh, here in Chicago, and that was fantastic, um, as well as been a, being able to attend other lectures, uh, like one at Boston University, another one at Dartmouth, and the reason for that is because I'm like, I don't have to drive or move, I can just roll on up, you know, <laughs> to my computer, and then attend these lectures instead of having to fight for tra fight through traffic, and find parking, you know, all that baloney, and it doesn't help that we have a preschooler at home, so it's much easier for me to step on and step off. Um, the worst though um, was definitely work tried to have a murder mystery and it was just <laughs> awkward. It was, and it says a lot when the person with NVLD says it's awkward. It, was <laughs> um, it didn't help. I was really, really sick at that point. And I was, I mean, physically I was, I was sick. I had, uh, I had severe morning sickness. I'm pregnant. And I was just like, I was like, oh, oh I can't do this. I can't do yeah. this. I got to act. I can't act. Can I just go to bed? <laughs> so it's, and it was also hard because I was like, are you acting? Are you not acting? It was, you know, it, it's very harder to get those nuances via Zoom as opposed to being in person in that case, as opposed to a lecture where if someone is very engaging and also has everything written and sends you the notes like those are great like online lectures are awesome it's when you have to really interact and you have to keep watching and it, it's it's exhausting and especially if you're not in a good physical mood it's those it yeah interesting okay anybody else It's been accessible. I mean, like with Zoom, it's nice that you can turn off the video option. If you get overwhelmed, you can take kind of that break, but it's accessible in the sense that like I don't drive because of my NVLD. So it's been convenient for me. I can access more like meetings and conferences I otherwise wouldn't have been able to like in person because of the distance and so forth. So that's been convenient for me. But um, the Zoom fatigue is real. So I think like the accessibility function of being able to like turn on your video, turn off your video, have those breaks have been great. Yeah, and Megan, for you too, you guys have been on an even stricter lockdown. So you, yeah, to the US where we're we slowly have, crawling out of it. <laughs> yeah, like we've had a little more freedom to have like smaller group meetups across the US. Um, people have gone back to work. Like we've been back in the office since a year ago next week. Oh, wow. Um, and so I know that you guys have actually had stricter lockdown. So you've mm -hmm. been working from home as well as trying to maintain a social yeah. life. And I do university online as well. So I'm like literally glued to my computer all the time. So I've been finding it, you know, exhausting because um, I don't really get that break. I don't get to see my friends or anyone in person. So it's been weird when I hear about the US like getting back to in-person stuff. I'm like, what? Like that's like yeah. foreign to me. <laughs> We're still locked down. We're crawling out. Like it's been crazy, so. Yeah. And go ahead. What are some of the things you do to fight Zoom fatigue? Um, definitely meditation. That's something that I fell in love with um, over COVID, all the quarantine stuff. Meditating has been like my go-to activity. It just kind of like helps relax like my eyes and like all the anxiety and everything I deal with all day being online for so long or um, just watching something funny on Netflix helps to yeah, I just trying to get like away, even if it's just for like, it's, you know, so yeah, it helps. And Benjamin, you're also working remotely and doing um, probably most of your 
client work is through Zoom as well. Do you find that you're on Zoom all day long? Also? Yeah, I mean, I, I use a HIPAA compliance service, but yes, it's it's um, yeah. it is a lot, and it's great to take breaks, and it's great to be able to to meet up with people as well. Um, some groups work faster on Zoom, and some groups don't. You know, some groups are more depending on the nature and dynamics of it, and the, some people like to be in their home when they're socializing, and, and it depends, you know, some, sometimes you want to do an activity, so if I'm doing an activity with somebody or a group of people, I prefer to do that in person, other kinds of groups, it's okay to do that, where it's just like I'm at my apartment and they're at home as well. Definitely, and Aaron, so you, you live in a dorm, correct? Yeah, so I live in a residence hall, my office is down the hall from my apartment, but because of COVID, a lot of like our student meetings were primarily over Zoom because you can't socially distant in my office. It's not that big. Um, so really trying to build in Zoom breaks in the afternoon. Uh, we did have some in-person student contact for like emergencies, but most of our day-to-day -day student meetings were on Zoom. So I think it's really the importance of blocking your calendar after a meeting that you know that either if you need time to process, um, that's really important so that you can maybe work out project work so you're not staring at your computer screen and in Zoom meetings all day, every day. Yeah, definitely. Did you guys have students in the dorms over the last year or is it? Yeah, so we've had, um, I work at a large research one institution. So we had a few thousand students here um, also working with students that were COVID positive or going into quarantine or isolation. So we had a large role in all that aspect as well at my current institution. Okay, awesome. Oh, we had Ryan come back. We had him for a second. I know, <laughs> our other ambassador away. was in the waiting room. Oh, here he is again. Okay, so we're gonna let Ryan in. Um, he is our fifth ambassador to join us today. So we'll bring him into this Zoom call. Hello. Hi guys. Sorry I'm late. No, you're fine. Hi Ryan. How are you? Good. I'm Samantha. This is Sam. Um, we're live on Facebook. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself really quick and then we're going to get back into our questions. Oh, hey. Uh, so guys, Ryan, I'm 35 years old. I have MVLD. I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, but we'll be moving to sunny Florida in July, end of July. I'm very excited. Um, I work as a teaching assistant at a special education school. I also do uh, community integration with adults with disabilities, um, privately and through different agencies. And I also do recreation programming for two different townships. One's virtually now and the other is in person. So that's with adults. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad to be here, answer any questions. It's yeah. great to be on here. Awesome, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I have someone else saying that they have no sound. If you can't hear us, but you can read our closed captioning, go to the bottom right-hand corner of the video on Facebook click on that little speaker and make sure that we are not muted and then pull your volume up. You should be able to hear us after that because I know that we do have sound. So just make sure that we're not muted on your Facebook. Um, so anyway, we're gonna hop back into our questions um, as far as we're talking about like social scenes and friendships and just kind of Zoom fatigue is where, where we just um, ended and left off with. So, I know that Megan mentioned some meditation. Do any of you have any other ways that you're coping with kind of like going from digital life all day to how are you like decompressing at night or on the weekends? Are you decompressing? Do you find that you're fatigued? Um, anything like that? Any other I, advice? <laughs> I think I go for walks. Um, some of my colleagues and I also play tennis together. So trying to get outside and be COVID safe um, has been our main priority. Um, especially since it rains a lot here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, um, I've been fatigued. Yeah, um, I work at the school. We've been virtual a lot and I don't like staring at a computer for <laughs> four or five hours. It gets very boring to me. I always have to be doing something. My mind's always racing and thinking about things. 
Um, so I go to the gym five to six days a week. Um, that's my outlet. And tried meditation, tried some yoga. Hasn't been successful, but I'm still going to keep at it. Yeah. I think Me Megan can attest that it helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> meditation has definitely helped me. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I think everyone kind of has their own way, but it sounds like a lot of it comes down to being outside with fresh air and exercise or something that is like getting your heart racing a break away <laughs> definitely so you're not stuck in cyberspace all the time <laughs> yeah I've it's also I've also been doing hello fresh um to like, oh, I do those too um, <laughs> which is super convenient it just comes and like all I need to do is cook dinner yeah. and it's, um something more creative than an average like dinner that Bio I cook. different recipes right yeah, yeah. that's so. what I did at the beginning of the pandemic I ordered a bunch of them and I'm like ah this is so cool and I just kept ordering them I fell in love with it yeah do you, definitely find, enjoy this. do you find that the directions on the like meal kits where they're so they mail you all of your ingredients you don't have to go out and do any shopping which is nice yeah and um, they send you everything and then they also send you instructions and step-by-step some of them even have pictures. Do you guys find that those are easy to follow and like easy to make at the end at the end of the day? I know they take a while. I also use HelloFresh, so they're very comprehensive. Yeah, steps. Some of them are complicated. <laughs> it, I I mean, you can choose like the easier ones and like the more challenging ones on the website. But some of them, I'm like, this definitely does not take like under 25 minutes. It'll take me like an hour to do some of the recipes because it's like so tedious. And with NVLD, it's like following all the directions and using all the different tools and all the food cutting and stuff. So it can be tedious for sure. Sometimes I just meal prep on a weekend. If I know I have to work late one night, it's just like, I just meal prep the HelloFresh food, which is yeah. kind of helpful. <laughs> That's awesome. Never got into that, but maybe in the future. I would like yeah. To try that. But I, I'm also like, you know, I like directions. I like following things and I'll have to explore that in the future. Yeah, and it measures right. everything out for you too. So like they only send you what you need. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about like measuring it. You don't have to worry about like cutting the recipe in half if there's only one person versus two. Like you just pick everything they send you. Um, exactly. But yeah, they're good. Hello Fresh for the win. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, But this is a good question. And we've actually talked about this before with a bunch of different professionals as well. And we may have touched on this on the last um, Ambassador Facebook Live. But when you're in college or when you're in a school setting, um, you're able to meet people because school forces you to, whether it's in class or through social events or through different clubs and activities that you're required to do for school. So when you're out of school, whether it's like getting into the real world after high school or after college, there's a shift and you don't have that anymore. So no one's planning out your social activities. No one's forcing you to sit in a classroom with other people taking the same class. Um, how do you stay organized in that shift and how do you like make that transition to where you're kind of, your life wasn't managed by school, but it was made easier by knowing what that schedule was to going into a lot of you guys kind of work for yourselves or work from home or have a little more flexibility. How do you guys manage that transition um, from, ed, from an educational setting to a non-educational setting? Uh, I can speak to this organization, organization, organization. Um, I mean, I'm not going to deny the fact that doing a doctorate was basically the equivalent a lot of people think oh if uh, getting a PhD means it's just the same as it's just a continuation of college no those are lies <laughs> it's absolute lies it is a lot it's it's you're basically committing to a mo monastic oh, lifestyle where there's you know as soon as you get off work you're still studying you're still reading um and with that like it was almost like I had to still figure out you know, even though I was on campus, I wasn't a college student, you know, I'm a researcher. Um, and with that one, it was just organization and what is my priority. 
uh, Lauren Vanderkam does a great job explaining this in uh, her Before Breakfast podcast. And basically it came down to what were the things that I loved the most as a student, as a university student, and how can I still keep that in my life? Um, obviously I don't have the same amount of free time as I did in college. And even in college, I didn't have a lot of free time, but I made priorities where, for instance, I really liked being outside, which I've noticed is a common theme with NBLD people. We were, we're a very outdoorsy people I've noticed. Um, and in this case, you know, how do I make the outside work when I'm not in a super, in an area known for its pristine beauty? You know, I no longer live in Oregon or California. I live in the Midwest. So I joined a cycling club and looking up places where it's like, hey, where can we meet up? Where can we do things? Um, and the nice thing is also looking at communities that are more inclusive. So in my case, most cyclists are very inclusive. They just want more people to ride with. Um, and the same goes for other communities as well. So look, looking up, uh, inclusive communities and looking up really in person, which can be really a struggle, but like, that's one of the nice things about places like REI or your neighborhood bike shop is normally there are communities associated with them and it goes from there. Same with any hobbyist workshop. So for instance, if you're into crafting, going to places like, I mean, I'm, I don't like saying it, but sometimes places like Michael's, which even though it's a chain store, it might be a good place to see if there's a community board. I love old fashioned community boards for that reason, because they're very visual. I mean, we're in BLD, we're very visual people. Um, seeing if there's, a, if there's a visual board there. It's the same thing with coffee shops. Is there things going on? Um, you know, really identifying your hobbies. Like for instance, I'm like, I enjoyed track, not because I love, you know, competing against other people, but because I love being outside and I like running or I liked doing this. I love, you know, I'm like, I enjoy playing soccer, but I hated all of the intense amounts of social interaction that come with soccer. I just want to run. So being able to identify what you really like and then finding those communities either online or in person, uh, usually through a store can be really helpful. Sorry, sorry. I went on a tangent there. One weird community that I found young people are going for right now is the ultimate Frisbee community. Oh, that's been going on for a while. Yeah. Frisbee. You're going to make a lot of friends. They're a very inclusive group. And I almost wish I could make like a chart of which groups are more inclusive and which ones are like, uh, these people tend to gatekeep like you wouldn't believe. Almost like an NVLD warning. But I think that's a blog post I'll write later. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. I like that idea of like the REI workshops or even like the craft stores um, having like groups where you can come in. I know across the street from our office, there's a place called Loop of the Loom and they do like weaving and stuff. And then they have classes where you can make like dog leashes or I don't know. I just noticed that one because I have a dog. So I don't know what else they do, but I feel like those kinds of like local crafty type places are a good place to find again, that common core with the hobby or interest. That's a good idea. Are all really great ideas. I mean, I um, for me, I try to be very meticulous about you know where I go, how, what what groups I'm gonna I'm gonna be interested in, and making sure that there are groups that there's a lot of continuity, consistency in the attendance of different people, so that I'm going to a place where there's gonna be the same people every week. Uh, because I think what happens in New York, especially, is you can go join a group and then there's like a different set of people the next week. So you have to be very uh, aware of of doing that. So I, I do. I do do that um, in terms of researching the group and looking at the profiles ahead of time to make sure these people have been there a long time, et cetera. For me, that's an important attribute as aspect. Um, I also really try to be careful and aware of when, how often I'm contacting friends. You know, when am I contacting them? How when, be, uh, when was the time I last scheduled a time to talk, et cetera? Because otherwise, if I'm if I'm not kind of being conscious of that, I, it, things can drop. Uh, can get dropped and I want to make sure I remember okay I spoke to that person a month ago maybe it's a good time that I reach out to them now so kind of keeping a mental track of that a mental note of that is really important. I have that problem too um, I over like I've tried to over plan things for for people like trying to plan uh, things that I'm, I'm, I'm moving soon so I'm trying to plan some some social events for people that I work with 
and it's it's not going good. Because the the uh, the um, I'm not getting any the reciprocal like back and forth. I'm not getting any. Of that. That's me. So I feel like I'm doing all the work, and I'm tired of putting myself out there like that. Um, dude, you know, it's a lot of stress. I'm feeling a lot of stress with that, and I'm just just uh, other times. You know, I've tried to contact people, and they're you know, I don't want to, I tend to overdo it. Like I'll contact him a couple of times, but as you were mentioning, you guys face it out then, you know, yeah. and I really have to learn how to do that. It's hard for me to do and without pushing them away. So what I found um, that most successful is I'm, I was scared to join um, a, a social league. Like a, I'm in the sport, so adult social leagues i've been for about three years and i was like i'm not going to do this and i finally did it and then i joined uh, another league another league and i've been on a good track i met a couple close people who i you know hang out with here and there they're really reliable and i'm in one now so but i've noticed some teams are like different like i've had some close teams some non-close teams so that was that's a hard part too um and also, I tried some meetups. That has been a hit or miss, depending on where, what the meetup has been. But I look to when I go down to Florida, since I knew nobody, I've never actually been to the place I'm actually going. My parents have, and they will help me transition there. To so try to get involved in groups uh, with different my on my levels, you know, through my um, I'm Jewish, so in the Jewish organization. Just to and not so and not to put so much pressure on myself. Just go with the flow more. I'm like a planner, so I like things, you know, laid out. I like, you know, what are we doing next week? What are we doing the following week? You know, I have it on the calendar. But what if ch things change? Because we got to learn to to be flexible. Like I teach the kids and adults I work with. You know, everything can't be 100% all the time. We gotta just. You know, got to be flexible, got to have backup plans. So that's what I'm, that's my approach. And I would say like, try to, well, also I have another thing to say. Um, I recently joined an app called uh, Clubhouse. If anybody's heard of that, it's getting really popular. Uh, it's becoming really addicting to me. But at first I started to follow everybody. Literally, like, follow everybody. I would go into a room, just follow everybody, like Facebook. You know, just follow everybody. And now I'm being more selective. What types of room I go into. I'm going to, like, the neurodiversity rooms to, like, spread my story and tell them about myself. And I'm really connected to the people that, you know, they can relate on my level. Um, and then um, I haven't, like, met anybody on there, like, personally. But I'm... You know, trying to develop some relationships, and maybe one day it'll turn into friendships or a, or a business contact. But for now, it's just it's just talking and getting myself out there. And yeah, I would highly recommend it to people. Um, they're just really developing the app to end users on iPhone. But um, yeah, it's a good app. And I finally um, monitored. I was a monitor of a room, or co-monitor of a room couple of days ago about autism and sports and it was really cool just to see the like a lot of people didn't know about like what was out there and people are accepting on there um you just have to find the right room and yeah so that's my take awesome thanks ryan appreciate that you're welcome anybody else do you guys yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna add, I love book clubs, but I think that they're a great, a great venue for me, but that's all. Okay. Yeah, hmm. book clubs are great. There's a, um, it's mainly geared towards females, but there is a group on Facebook and they have, or not on Facebook, Instagram, and there's probably like eight to 10 chapters across the US at this point. It's called Books, Brunches, and Booze. Oh, okay. And it's a book club also. They're like, and there's one in New Jersey, one in New York City. I think there's like Raleigh, North Carolina, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, a couple of different ones. So I, I 
definitely think that finding those like niche groups, whether it's through meetup.com or Facebook or a friend of a friend or Instagram or whatever it is, I think social media has kind of made it easier to, and, and the apps, Ryan, like you were talking about, apps have made it easier to, to meet people post-educational life um, outside of school at whatever level that ends for everybody. Um, oh, there was something I was gonna go back to. I cannot remember, so I will think of it in just a minute. Um, so we've talked about friendships and we've talked about social scenes and meeting friends. And so I want to switch gears at this point because we are, let's see what time is it? It's 1240. Um, so I wanna switch gears because we've been talking about this for a little bit. I wanna talk about dating for just a little bit for maybe like 10 minutes. And then we will open it up to questions. If you're watching, live, go ahead and post your questions in the comments now if you have anything you want to ask a specific person. Um, we'll see if they're willing to answer. If you have anything you want to say that you want us to share, put that in the comments. We'll share that at the very end, like the last 10 minutes. But let's talk about dating a little bit because I think that is also something that we get a lot of emails and phone calls and comments about all the time, whether it's from parents or adults. Um, but everyone that's with us today is at a different stage of the dating spectrum. So we'll put it on a spectrum of not dating to married with children. So we have kind of all of the different perspectives with us today and the different experiences. Um, I just, I think I'm going to open it up to like share what you want about dating. What has worked? What do you hate? What do you love? How do you find success? I know we spoke a little bit at the beginning. Benjamin has written some articles on our blog about dating. So if you want to check those out, definitely recommend it. He also has more on his website, I believe. Right, Benjamin? Yes, I'm running a workshop on it too. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you can yeah. share that with us. Um, but I'm just going to open it up. I'm not going to prompt you guys. If you want to share where you're at on that spectrum, feel free. You do not have to. But... I'm, I'm going to open this up to you guys and let's start with the girls. Where are we at? Um, I can start with the opposite uh, per, uh, spectrum. Uh, I am married to my husband, Eric. Uh, we have been married for f six years. Sorry, we've been married since 2015. Um, we started dating in 2010 and uh, we ha are, have a preschooler and, we also, and we're expecting daughter number two. So we've, been, we've had a very successful marriage and we do joke that a huge part of it is um, simply the fact that we're almost like two human cats where we love hanging out with each other, but then we very quickly go and do our own things. Uh, my husband's an engineer, he's very much into gaming and uh, he is like, it's interesting because he has a lot of friends who are definitely on the autism spectrum. He himself is not, but he's very good at managing them. And it's fascinating to watch them play board games because he basically just knows how to talk with them. And I do wonder if that's why he and I get along so well. Um, we met in a weird way. Um, we met online. I started an online joke profile. Like I didn't take it serious at all, uh, which really upset a lot of uh, guys that were potential because all of the other girls are making cute faces and I'm in a monkey costume drinking a beer. Um, <laughs> I was doing a yoga pose with my neighbor's dog. Um, and then I think there was just like a picture of me like passed out on a couch. Like I, I like I did not take it serious at all. Um, which actually like that that got rid of a lot of people because I'm like, oh, I want you to like me. I'm like, here's me in my fly monkey costume in Urbana Champagne. Deal with it. Um, he thought it was interesting. He also thought it was interesting that I was a that I was a fellow at Texas Tech where he was uh, getting his master's. And uh, shortly afterwards, we exchanged numbers just because we wanted to talk about our research and then uh we talked about we were talking about hobby groups earlier here so one of my hobbies that i used to do but unfortunately i don't have time anymore and neither does my husband is we're both uh brewers we're both beer brewers and uh we both met up at a random beer brewery meetup and we just started chatting and all of a sudden we realized that i know we're like wait a minute did aren't aren't you man in the kilt 69 and it's like yeah <laughs> i'm leaving buck 85 that's funny. Yeah. And uh, 
yeah but a week later i i dumped my on off boyfriend that i was dating and went with my boy went with him full time and yeah five years later we uh got married and uh we've yeah <laughs> we're kind of living the uh norman rockwell life and one thing i can definitely say is i i talked about hobbies definitely one thing i cannot recommend enough is start with hobbies and also go in with i hate to say this go in with low expectations no <laughs> uh a lot of times people take themselves really seriously when they're on the dating scene and when i started and it was really hard so my husband and i met it, at the time it felt like we were both super old which now i look back on and i was like oh god that's ridiculous uh we met when he was 24 and i was 25 and i was like yeah i'm probably gonna be an old maid because all my other friends were getting engaged i know a lot of people getting married but i was in a conservative part of the country i'm in texas and yeah it's uh yeah, the, the tortoise and the hare definitely applies to this one because almost every single person I know who got engaged after a super short relationship, uh, every I have attended, I'm 35 now, we have attended so many divorce parties this year, it's kind of haunting. Yeah, it's no. COVID <laughs> obliterated. Oh my goodness. It's terrible. It, it, it's ter oh terrible. My goodness. I'm cracking up because I forgot <laughs> that you were my fellow Red Raiders, so I also went to the tech. Um, also... <laughs> Grew up in a conservative community and got married really young. I'm no longer married, so I'm laughing because I like followed that exact path. It's so funny, but I totally forgot you were at Texas Tech too. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if I was rubbing up any wounds. Here not, we go. Some no, oh my gosh, like, not at all. I, I have no Texas, idea. It is so true. It is so true. Yeah, um, but. And that's the one thing. And another thing too is, uh, and this has nothing really to do with NVLD, but just people in general, do not rush down the freaking aisle. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't. Unless there's a green card or someone's in like really, really need health insurance. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't. Take your time. Oh my goodness. So but really you don't love it. And this is, this, I mean, it, to, to bring this back to having NVLD, this is one thing that I felt a lot having NVLD is a lot of people are like, oh, you're learning disabled. You just, you don't understand emotions like we do, like normal mm -hmm. people do. And it, it put the onus on, well, maybe I just don't get other people. Maybe I just don't get romance. Maybe this stuff. And then I'm like, no, everybody's sense of intimacy and romance is different. Like, I don't want some clown climbing on me all the time, like touching me all the time. Like I did go away. I don't want that. Um, I want somebody who's just going to give me a little bit of attention and then go back to whatever the hell they're doing. And then I go back to my crafting or writing or what or my bike, whatever. Yeah. And really understanding yourself with that is so crucial with dating because if you're uncomfortable, but you're like, oh, I'll deal with that in a little bit it's all get over that you're not going to get over it yeah it's it's like saying oh these shoes are eventually gonna fit me I just need to get over the fact they give me blisters no throw those shoes out <laughs> yeah that's awesome Megan where um not where <laughs> what advice would you give as far as like communicating with a significant other or someone that you're dating as far as like communicating your needs um your like if you're misunderstanding something they're saying how do you handle that type of communication with yeah you? so I think like with NVLD we're very naive when it comes to dating like I've been in situations where like before my well I'm with my boyfriend now we've been together for eight years but like previously to that I was very naive and like you know, picking up the social cues and knowing what to do. And I was just in very uncomfortable situations. Um, so I think it's just really important to just like have that really open conversation with your partner and be like, Hey, I have NVLD and this is what it is because that's what I did with my boyfriend. And it kind of got the elephant out of the room and he kind of understood like how my brain operated a little bit better because like, he, you know, he didn't see it before. He was like, well, you know, you get straight A's in college. Like, I don't understand. How do you have NVLD? But I struggle with driving and like, I struggle with like other areas in my life. So like, I think just having that really open and, you know, intimate conversation with your partner regarding your NVLD is important because it's going to just cause so many other problems in the future if you 
keep it hidden in the closet, right? So having those open conversations about how you, you know, how you operate, how your brain works is really important, I think. Can I ask at what point in the, re- I, if you're comfortable sharing, at what point in the relationship mm. did you have that conversation with him? Trying to think. It's so weird because like we were friends. So like, it was like, kind of like, whoa, really? You have a learning disability? Um, I think it was like within maybe the second month of us dating. I want to say, I can't say 100%, but yeah, it was kind of like a surprise and shock. Like he was good with it, but it was just like, whoa, really? Like you have a learning disability? I didn't know. So it was um, a bit of a shock, but I mean, having that conversation and just getting it on the table is important. So I think that's the best advice and just don't go into situations you don't feel comfortable. Um, Don't be naive. Like I was in many situations where I wish I could look back and change some of the things I did, but that's life. So unfortunately we have to go through those situations, but just, you know, have those deep conversations. And I think that gets a lot on the table for sure. Awesome. Ryan, Aaron, do you guys have anything that you would want to share as far as the dating world. We even get, um, I answer our phone line and a lot of times I'll talk to people who have a lot of struggle just knowing where to start. Like when they're in a situation that's, is this just friends? Is this something I can pursue? Will that make them uncomfortable? Yeah, well, I'll tell you about my experiences. Um, so I've been on a lot of dating apps, um, Jewish, non-Jewish, but it's been hard. Um, uh, 35. I see everybody, um, a lot of the people I know, friends getting married, have kids just getting older. It's like, um, either I'm not being on the right sites or I'm, I, I just don't know. It's just been really difficult and frustrating. Um, you know, my aunt's coming out now. Um, I am moving, so I haven't been dating. Uh, I will be when I get down there. It's just going to be a whole nother world of like where to find the people. So I'm going to try to do the meetups, um, try to do the apps, different apps. I'm going to, I'm going to switch it up. It's just got to be like fresh. You got to find. And also the thing is sometimes in my profile, I would put about, I have NVLD and sometimes I wouldn't. And that would be a hit or miss. So it depends on the site. It depends if you want to reveal it right in the profile. But Megan, you were saying you revealed it about two months in. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to ask Megan, how was that revealing it? And uh, why, uh, if you don't mind asking, why, why did you wait a couple months? I don't know if it was two months exactly. I'm just like, it was a long time ago, but um, yeah. yeah, Um, Like, why did you wait? Yeah, just why did you wait? Um, Did you not feel comfortable enough? Was, did you? Yeah, I think I was very like like, in the closet still about my learning disability diagnosis. Like I still didn't really, I didn't even understand what NVLD was like when I was my first year in college like I was very much still in the closet so I just like came out and said I have a learning disability I don't even think I said I have NVLD because I didn't really understand it at that time um so it was it was awkward um I just said like I have a learning disability and I struggle with math so that was one of the first things I said to my boyfriend and then as I like got into disability studies, which is my program now, I started diving deeper into my NVLD diagnosis because I really didn't know what it meant. So then I started researching it more and then I came to my boyfriend again and I was like, this is what I have. Like, this is why I struggle with like maps and like social cues and everything else. So then he started piecing together the pieces and he's like, ah, so that makes sense. Like this is why you have trouble driving. This is why you have trouble socializing with some of, you know, my friends and stuff. So um, I think it was, you know, an awkward, but very uh, important conversation. Now, would you recommend um, me, like this is open to anybody, but um, 
I just wanted to ask, would you recommend me putting it on the profile or waiting? Um, that's a I've personal. I've tried both in the past and it's like. Yeah, it's so mess. personal and like, <laughs> it's such an intimate part of yourself, right? Um, I mean, if that was, if that were me, um, I don't even know what I would do. Maybe I would put like, I'm neurodiverse because that's something that I've become like, more open to like I'm neurodiverse so that's something that like I identify with so maybe starting with that and that could maybe create a conversation people might be like what does neurodiverse mean or you know you might have people who connect more with that not a lot of people know about NVLD so (laughs) I mean I didn't even know not a lot of people know what it is yeah and that's what I struggle with with my boyfriend like I knew it was NVLD, but I didn't really know what it was. I'm just like, how do I even have this conversation? Like, I'm just like, well, I basically have a math disability, but like, I didn't have all the other pieces to fully understand it. So it was like kind of putting together the pieces as like our relationship started to grow. So it was kind of like a beautiful, you know, intimate kind of <laughs> growth, you know, so. Uh, I, I mean it's go ahead no I, I, I was just gonna say thank you mm-hmm. you're welcome oh thank you for sharing that that's, that's interesting I I mean I don't think there's like a you know a play script for everybody but uh I um I try to when I was dating always focus in on on what are my strengths you know and what I can offer others and you know really thinking about the verbal memory that I had you know and how I could use that to my advantage in different situations um, and when I talk about my learning difference, I do talk about the neurodiversity aspect of it. I really, I think people can grasp, you know, we all have a set of strengths and weaknesses and it doesn't make me, uh, how I've coped with that, how I've gone through that, how I've, um, with the strengths I bring because of that are part of who I am and part of what I would want to be, I'd be, I'd be appreciated by somebody I'm with. So having that sense and being able to communicate that, um, you know, has some more receptivity. But I kind of like try to research like before when I'm dating, you know, where am I going? What are the right noise level? What are the right activities for me? How do I practice reading the body language beforehand if I need to? You know, sometimes I practice a little beforehand imagining what different kind of things mean. Am I going to be in an environment where it's kind of like there's not so much noise and I can really focus in a little bit. If it's a very distracting bar or a very noisy environment, that's not always the best fit. So I kind of try to plan it out in my head and I don't, I don't date like a lot. I date, I date one person then I process it and process what happened and then go on a date with another person. So I'm just like date after date after date. Um, and, um, you know, that's just, that's just how I would, would approach it. Yeah. I think that's really good advice because basically what you're saying is you're setting yourself up to be in a successful situation so that mm-hmm. you give yourself the best shot at getting to know that person without having those distractions that may deter from the conversation or right. the relationship building. So I think that's really good advice that would make a great blog post. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's planning, you know, planning is key because we. I feel like I have to plan. I have to plan a little bit more before I go on a date, which is fine. And if I do that planning and if it's the right environment, then it's easier for me to create this thing, which I think is so hard for someone who has chemistry. You know, how do you, how do you create that with somebody? It's difficult. But um, if you have the right environment and you have, and your strengths are being at play, right? That's, that's, it's, you have a better shot at it for sure. I have to take that approach, Benjamin, uh, because me, I'm like, how many dates can I get? You know, <laughs> you know like talk about it to some mm-hmm. people and they're like, do you have another one? Yeah, I have another one. But it's not, it's not how many, it's, you know, it's the, you know, you got to get to know the person, you know, it's yeah. not, it's the quality over the quantity. Mm-hmm. And that's what um, my dad always says about friends too. It's not how many friends you have, it's the quality of friends that you have. If he only has like five friends, but they're quality, then it's not quantity. And my biggest problem, biggest thing I dealt with over the years is trying to have as many friends as I can, right. but they weren't right. quality friends. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, in just in social interactions, at least for me, I think it's a really good point. You know, I need to prepare more. So I can't prepare and have that kind of quantity. So I just allow myself a little more time to do that. And then I feel like, well, and then I, what my, my follow-up plan has to take or 
a meeting? How am I going to follow through that? I'm going to build on what I, what I, we did in the first time. So I'm kind of being thoughtful about it, you know, as I go through it. Yeah, at least that's been my, my approach. That's awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. I appreciate the conversation, the three of you guys like interacting with each other. I think it's good advice. Erin, do you have anything that you would want to add? I don't think so. I think I've, I've moved around the country for about the last four, four and a half years, every two years. Yeah. Um, I was in DC for grad school for two years and now I've been, been in Pennsylvania for two years. So I think, and mainly it's been mostly COVID um, the last two years. So I think now that COVID's ending, um, getting into dating and all that type of stuff um, as my plan now that COVID finally lifting. Yeah. But I've just moved so much over the last few years that it's been challenging for sure. Yeah. So we are hitting our hour mark. Um, we yeah. don't have a lot of questions, but I have a feeling that as the day goes on and this video is on Facebook longer, that as more people watch it, they'll probably have some stuff. So if you guys can each kind of come back and maybe check in with us a little later um, today or tomorrow, just to see if there's anything specifically. Um, there are a couple of people that we want to connect um, with some of you guys, so we may be reaching out saying, hey, do you mind if we like give them your email or connect you guys um, somehow? Because yeah. I think that it really helps to feel like you're relating to someone. Um, but I have an ending conversation that I kind of was thinking about, Megan, when you and Ryan were talking, because Megan, you were using the term neurodiverse. And Ryan, you were saying that in your dating profile, you put in BLD. So my question is, and we also, I don't know if you guys took the adult survey, but some of our adults and parents have taken the survey that we're doing with Columbia. And in it, we're talking about changing the name as well of NBLD. Um, I'm sorry, I actually have to go. I'm really okay. sorry, but thank you so much for everything. <laughs> thank, thank you. For everything. Um, but just, I want to kind of hit on the difference between when you are talking to someone about your NBLD, whether it's a friend, a parent, someone you don't know, or someone you're dating, do you use the words NBLD and do you explain what NBLD is or do you talk about being neurodiverse um, and what that means? Or do you differentiate or do you even talk about it? Um, I do both. <laughs> so I just will come out and say like, you know, when I first started dating my boyfriend in college, like, like I said, like, I had no idea what NPLD was. I just said, I have a learning disability. So now being in the program I'm in disability studies and learning more about the disability community and being more like neurodiverse, um, I will say both, like, I will tell my, my family and my friends, like I have NBLD and then they'll like what is that so I'll have to explain it and then um usually they will be like but you're so smart like I don't understand how do you have that <laughs> and then I go into like well that's what neuro being neurodiverse is like it's you know seeing the strengths that you have despite having a label and be able to attach to your name so I think being neurodiverse is just a really beautiful way of like understanding NVLD and acknowledging like, yeah, I have it, but I also have a lot of really good strengths too. Awesome. Yeah. I would have to say that I never heard the term neurodiverse until I joined Clubhouse. Oh, and cool. all I hear is neurodiverse. Yeah. Um, and nobody knows what NVLD is there. <laughs> Oh, I had to struggle is real. To them. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, uh, my explain to them the way you can look up the MVLD project <laughs> that I plugged. And I'm like, they got involved and this and that. But I was, yeah, it's just um, to my, you know, because this year I finally came out to my coworkers and said that I had a nonverbal learning disability. And I told them, you know, not, I didn't go too in depth of what it, what it was, but just, you know, and, and now I'll start sharing their story and, you know, getting more confident about, you know, NVLD. But I also would use um, neurodiverse now too, uh, depending who it is. So, I mean, I use both. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's a, um, a shame to use both. Uh, it depends situation, depends what you feel comfortable with, who you're talking to. Yeah, and that's what I would say. That's 
Awesome. Anyone else? Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys so much. I feel like this was a very organic, like just people talking conversation. Um, I think we're getting some good feedback from that, that people are really enjoying like listening to this. There is one question just about what's the best place for those with MBLD to meet. So I have a list that we, um, of different things we talked about today that I'm going to put in the comments just to kind of like drop that list. And it's, it's not like specific places, but it's like ideas. And then from there, maybe if you guys are watching or anybody that was involved, if you have a specific place that you want to maybe include a link to, um, feel free to drop that in the comments below. You can also check out our Inspire webpage. Um, if you go to nbld.com or nbld.org, sorry, and then click on get involved. And then I think it's um, online support community. It'll take you to the Inspire website. It's a good place to kind of go if you have questions. I think we have about 440 people um, mm -hmm. on our Inspire page now, which I think is amazing just because that's a lot of people. And I feel like um, if everyone could just occasionally log on and maybe check it out, it's also a good place to kind of find people that you could relate to there's different topics but that's a good place to start as well so i'll drop that link in too and i'll include that list and then um we're going to connect some of our ambassadors who have a lot in common here as well um, if you want to become an ambassador if you're watching and you're an adult that wants to be involved in stuff like this and blog for us feel free to check that out on our website as well under the get involved tab and I think that's it. So thank you all for joining us for this month's Facebook Live. We will be back next month. I don't, I think we've already got someone scheduled, but Dr. I honestly Hoffman. can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Hoffman. <laughs> um, so we'll be back next month. We'll start posting about that as well. And then this video will live on our Facebook as well as our YouTube and our website. So feel free to drop comments and we'll come back and check them out. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation and we will see you all next month. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.